Did you ever do one of those plant projects in school, you know, where you get some sort of seed and you watch it grow from, you know, a seed to a plant? I actually think that my class, if I'm remembering correctly, used lima beans or some, some sort of seed that looked a lot like a lima bean. And we started by wrapping the dried bean in a damp paper towel. And then we put the paper towel in a plastic bag. And then we waited for it to germinate. I remember thinking that the little root looked like a tail. And then we carefully planted our seeds in some dirt in one of those plastic Dixie cups and set it somewhere where it could get some sunshine. And then... You had to be patient and wait and wait and wait. And finally, the stem would begin to poke its way out of the dirt. It's a miraculous process, seed to plant. And to think, it's constantly happening all around us. Even these winter months have a role to play as seeds lie dormant in the ground. Paul writes about seeds in today's text from 1 Corinthians. He connects the rhythm of faith to the rhythm of the natural world. This is a complicated passage of scripture I've been sitting with all of chapter 15 for a few weeks as I prepared for this sermon and for the sermon I was able to preach last weekend at uh, my former church in New York City. It's a complicated scripture, but it's a really good scripture. And I want to take us a little bit further into the chapter this morning so that we can hear the full picture of what Paul is writing. I'm even going to take us further than the lectionary says. I'm picking up where Alice left off with verse 39. For those who wish to follow along, this piece is not in your bulletin, but some later sections will be. So verse 39 says, not all flesh is alike, but there is one flesh for human beings, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are both heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of heaven is one thing, and that of the earth is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, Indeed, star differs from star in glory. Okay, let's pause for a moment. Again, it's, it's a little tricky. Paul is making a rather complicated theological argument throughout this chapter. And it, I'll admit, can be hard to follow. Again, I've been sitting with this scripture for weeks, and I have read it many, many times. So I want to summarize for a second where we are so far. Paul says that there are different types of flesh and there are different types of bodies and that all are part of God's creation. A fish has a different body from a bird and a human has a different body from like a panther or a rabbit. All good bodies and even heavenly bodies like stars and planets and moons look different. All right, let's continue with verse 42. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. 
It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Okay, let's pause again. Here, we start to get a little bit of Easter in February. Bonus, a little Easter before we even get to Lent. Paul is writing about bodily resurrection. And that's not something that we talk about often as a church. Because as 21st century people, sometimes it gets a little uncomfortable. And we have access to scientific knowledge that Paul and his original audience did not. Chemistry, biology, physics. And this complicates our understanding of the kind of resurrection Paul is talking about, literal bodily resurrection. Now, there's a lot of ways that contemporary thinkers talk about literal resurrection. But I want to focus this morning on what Paul has to say about it. We don't have to agree with it. Theologians like to argue about it all the time. But I want us to hear out what he has to say. Paul moves from talking about different sorts of natural bodies, fish, bird, human, to talking about the change from a physical to a spiritual body. He's saying just as a moon differs from a star, so does our natural body on earth differ from our spiritual body in heaven. Make sense so far? Okay, one, one step further. Verse 45, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the physical and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the human of dust, we will also bear the image of the human of heaven. Here, Paul puts everything in the context of scripture. He draws an arc from Adam to Jesus. Adam was a human created from dust, from dirt. Jesus was a human created from spirit. And from a woman's body, but I'm not going to pick that particular fight with Paul today. And Paul says that we will have both. We will have our natural bodies here on earth. And we will have a spiritual body in the next life. Oof. So now that we've heard all of this, the question becomes, why on earth is Paul talking about this in the first place? Well, the letter to the Corinthians addresses a number of conflicts and arguments that were going on in the congregation at the time, and one of which was resurrection. Paul and many early Christians believed that the apocalypse was imminent. They fully expected Jesus to return before they died. So you can imagine their confusion their dismay when members of the church began to pass on. And in the middle of this dismay, a couple of alternative viewpoints began to circulate. One was that there was no such thing as resurrection. And this bothered Paul for perhaps obvious reasons. Earlier, he writes, if you don't believe in resurrection, what do you believe about Christ? Another view was promoted by a group called the Enthusiasts. They sound kind of fun. They claimed that it didn't matter what you did with your body since it was already saved. Again, maybe sounds fun, but it could lead to a rather abusive relationship, actually, with your body and with the bodies of other people. 
And yet another viewpoint was touted by the dualists. They believed in this sharp split between body and soul, which might not sound like a big deal, but similar to the enthusiasts could lead to oppression or abuse of physical bodies. You can see how that logic might work. Well, if the body doesn't matter, then how we treat bodies doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we hurt or exclude or even oppress bodies that we don't like. So Paul steps into this with an embodied theology, a theology that says bodies matter to God. This makes sense, right? After all, God has been intimately involved with bodies. God created all sorts of bodies and called them good. God came as a body to live among us. Christ washed bodily feet and healed bodily wounds and died a bodily death. Paul says, our natural bodies matter. And they're different yet connected to our spiritual bodies. In other words, there's this connection between now and whatever comes next. And he uses the metaphor of a seed to help us see this connection. It's a way for us to understand something supernatural, something that defies full comprehension, something eternal. We may not fully understand or know what happens after this life, but we know that a seed grows into a plant. We've seen it perhaps as early as kindergarten, preschool. We know that death brings forth new life. You see, it takes a little time to unravel the scripture, but once you do, I think it is deeply comforting. It is comforting for moments of grief, certainly, for it reminds us that this life is not the end. The people we love continue on. We might not know the details, the how, the where, but we know that there is resurrection. It is also comforting for moments when we need to let go. When we need to say goodbye to something, I'm talking more metaphorically here, the moments when we have to let go of a career, a relationship, a belief, those moments can be painful and scary, even when we know it's time to move on. I so clearly remember when I moved from New York City to Chicago. Oh, I knew it was the right choice. I knew that moving here and coming to grad school was the thing I needed to do But I had to say goodbye to friends, to a city that I loved, to a dream of being an actor. I knew it was the right choice, but oh my goodness, it was scary. The plant has to release the seed. The seed even has to let go of itself to become a plant. Remember that lima bean? It didn't stay a seed forever. It shed its seedness to become a plant. We often have to say goodbye. We have to let go so that something new can grow. This text comforts us by reminding us that life continues. It encourages us to let go, and it comforts us by giving the hope that all of this is already in process. What do I mean? If there is a connection between now and after, between the seed and the plant, that means that the future is sown in the present. Resurrection is already in process. My friends, can you believe that the seeds of something magnificent have already been planted in your life? The seeds of something that is going to blossom in your future have already been planted in the soil. I know, I know, you may not see it. We may not see it yet. Maybe those seeds are dormant. Or maybe they're just now putting down roots. Maybe they need a little water or a little sunshine. 
or for you to let go a little bit. But the seeds of something magnificent have already been planted. We have to trust the cycle. It's not easy to do, I know that, but trusting the signs of creation that are already around us. We see that, right? The seasons change. The seeds in your garden grow. A dad becomes a grandfather. A daughter becomes a mother. If it is so with the plants of the earth, why wouldn't it be so in our lives? The creativity of Christ that we see in scripture, the creativity of the Holy Spirit that we see around us, that is a reliable guide for the future. There are so many things that we could choose as guides. This is a reliable guide for our future. A dear friend of mine bought me a cookbook for Christmas. I've become rather obsessed with it. It's called Grist, a practical guide to cooking grains, beans, seeds, and legumes by Abra Barons. This is how you know you're getting older, right? When you get really excited about a book about beans. I love this cookbook. I love the methods and the recipes, but I especially love the author's dedication to writing about the food process. It's something that isn't usually included in cookbooks. And she writes, she fills the book with information about agriculture and about farmers, about where these beans and seeds and legumes come from. Farmers who literally sustain us every day and whose work is so, so difficult and becoming increasingly so. There are some really good interviews with all types of farmers, urban farmers, farmers who specialize in certain crops or with parts of the process, family farmers. And I want to read you an excerpt from one farmer in the book. His name is Wesley Wraith. He says, so what do I wish non-farmers knew? that there is no such thing as an agnostic farmer. Each farmer possesses some deep-seated belief that their work is inseparable from an inherent purpose far greater than their own self. Belief seems like the proper term here because farming instills in us a certain type of illogical, unreasonable, and by most accounts, unwise hope that each growing season holds the intoxicating promise of growing and cultivating and harvesting like we never have before. It is only with the addition of belief that farmers are able to remain ready, even hopeful, for the years that lie ahead of them. Just think about that next time you eat some beans. Hyde Park Union Church, my friends, we are in a time of great change. There are large scale upheavals, those connected to climate change, the threat of war, violence, and economic inequality around the globe. There are also the smaller but no less insignificant changes happening in our own lives. And the ones happening in our church body. Changes that come with aging. Changes that come with growing up. Changes that come with still relatively new leadership. Changes that come with new faces. Changes to our worship. Like what we're doing this morning, hybrid worship. That's still very new to me. Changes to our building. We're called to be like farmers, to have this belief, this hope that we are growing something here. If Paul were writing to our congregation, I think he would remind us that some things must end. That we have to say goodbye to the way that things were 50 years ago, 20 years ago, even five years ago. 
We have to say goodbye so that something new can grow, something connected to what came before, but that is transformed to fit the now. This is happening in churches and institutions around the country. Mainline Protestant church, church in general, doesn't work the way it used to work. I've said this before, but there was no class on pandemic in grad school. (laughs) Some things I learned just don't work the way that they used to work. But thanks be to God, the foundation of our tradition is resurrection. The foundation of our tradition says that life springs from death. We are so well equipped because the very fabric of our faith says that it's okay for things to change. It's okay to let go because the future, it is already sown. I so firmly believe that the seeds of what to come for this church for each one of us are already planted. The seeds are sown. So come, let us be farmers. Amen.